for having me here in Paris for two months. I'm uh, very excited to be here. Um, and also for giving me the chance to talk about uh, new work. In fact, this is a work in progress with uh, the following people, Nima Kanihamet, uh, Hayden Lee, and Guillermo Pimentel. And in fact, last night, I think we got our final results. <laughs> uh, and so I was able to actually incorporate something that happened uh, after midnight. And uh, there was something we were stuck with for the last couple of months. I think we solved it last night. And uh, so hopefully we will have a paper, a paper soon. And so the basic goal is to try and develop an understanding of inflationary correlation functions that parallels the understanding that we have of scattering amplitudes in, in flat space, or in ordinary particle, particle physics. And hopefully throughout the talk you'll understand what I mean by this. But uh, the upshot is that the way we think about scattering amplitudes is very much based on the, on the concepts of symmetries and singularities. So scattering amplitudes, at least at tree level, you know, are highly constrained uh, just on the basis of Lorentz invariance and uh, locality and unitarity and things like, things like that. And so we'd like to develop a kind of a, a language of speaking about cosmological correlators that parallels um, this type of, uh, type of reasoning. And so just to put us all on the same page, let me just remind you of some very textbook uh, stuff about scattering amplitudes. So if we think about scattering amplitudes at low energies, those scattering amplitudes are analytic functions of the Mandel sum variables S. S and T, if you look at um, of axis uh, scattering. Um, and that corresponds to an effective field theory expansion of the, of the theory. So at low energies, the theory is described purely by contact interactions. Like in a standard model, you know, the electroweak theory, you would have you know, four Fermi theory as a classic example of just contact interactions. And that has a specific analytic constraint on the, the scattering amplitude. If you go to high energy, higher energies, of course, then it's possible to, to develop non-singular behavior, uh, non-analytic behavior. And the first thing you see is, is kind of a tree level is simple poles, you know? just, you know, just classic resonances. And the fact that these are simple poles uh, is a consequence of lo locality. Um, and then if you go on the pole, uh, the, the, this four-point scattering amplitude develops into a product of three-point, on-shell three-point amplitudes. And summing over the different helicities of the exchange particle, this can be a particle of you know, mass and, and spin. If we sum over all the helicities of this massive spinning particle, we get some very simple angular dependence of the scattering process, which is given here. In three dimension, it's given by a Legendre polynomial of order the spin of the particle. Um, and then finally, the, the amplitude of this Legendre polynomial has to be a positive coefficient uh, because of unitarity. Okay? So this is just to illustrate that uh, you know, there's very little you can do, very little freedom you have at tree level to write down scattering amplitudes. And it doesn't depend on really writing down a Feynman diagram like this. This is just on the basis of, or even having a Lagrangian uh, available. Just the basis of uh, symmetries and a careful thinking about sing the possible allowed singularities allows you to pin down the structure of these, these uh, scattering amplitudes. And of course, in the history of particle physics, you know, detecting resonances has been very important like this graph here is illustrating. So measuring the position of a resonance tells us about the mass of a new particle. Measuring the actual shape of the resonance tells us about the lifetime of particles and how they couple to other degrees of freedom in the standard model, for example. Um, and measuring the, the final state angular dependence will, can tell us about the spin of the intermediate particles. Okay? So that's just a classic way in which particles are identified and characterized in, in ordinary collider physics. Um, so the question is, can we develop an analogous story in cosmology? Is there something, some way of phrasing cosmological correlators that parallels this, this way of thinking about uh, amplitudes? And so that's what I want to describe today. So of course, in cosmology, we don't measure scattering amplitudes. We measure cosmological correlators. And uh, so the earliest uh, measurement we have of these correlators arguably are fluctuations in the cosmic microwave background. So here are these temperature variations as a function of angle on the sky. Under some mild assumptions, we can trace these fluctuations back in time to the origin of the hot Big Bang. And then the simplest way of describing the statistics of these CMB fluctuations isn't just in terms of a single scalar variable, which we often choose to be the curvature perturbation zeta. Okay? Um, and then, in fact, you know, as Cliff already described, we have a very nice uh, theory that, g that gives us a mechanism to produce both scalar and tensor fluctuations at times before the hot Big Bang. Um, during a quasi dissider epoch in the, in the early universe. Um, and so at the moment, uh, you know, purely sc two-point scalar fluctuations are sufficient of describing this data. In the future, we hope to measure two-point tensor fluctuations that would give us kind of the two, the two uh, unique massless modes that inflation has to have. Um, 
But uh, from a theory level, the kind of these two-point functions are a little bit boring in the sense that they're almost uniquely fixed by symmetries. So a perfectly scale invariant to sit a background would have you know, two-point functions that are fixed up to an amplitude. Um, of course, we know that it, you know, inflation is a weakly broken de Sitter's phase, phase, so we have a weak breaking of that scaling symmetry. So then there are two numbers that characterize these, these spectra. But the spectra don't carry a lot of dynamical information about the theory. You know, I'm assuming vacuum fluctuation in a, yeah, we will, see to, we will get to my assumptions in a, in, in a moment. But if I'm assuming just a case where there's a, you know, I'm just I'm assuming vacuum fluctuation in a quasi dissita period, then the two-point function of those vacuum fluctuations are kind of fixed by the isometries of the dissita background to be. Um, Fair enough. We could have some additional break, you know, maybe discrete breaking of, uh, of, of the shift, sim the scaling symmetry during, or during inflation. Yeah, there could be that, or it could be even be more random. I mean, there's a lot of things. Okay, there. okay. There's Fine. Fair enough. Maybe this is a bit too strong. I'm trying to motivate looking for higher order interactions to, to, to kind of glean something about interactions. Yeah, yeah. No fine, fine, fine. Um, yeah, it also would be fantastic to measure tensors. I don't want to say that <laughs> measuring tensors is a boring thing to do. Um, but as you're going to see, I think from the setup that I'm going to be describing, kind of just at two-point level, which is a bit restrictive, just at the two-point level, you know, like most of information is kind of just contained in two numbers, and so we'd like to learn more than those those two numbers. Okay. Um, okay. And so in particular, that's why just like in the, in the you know in the flat space scattering amplitudes, we'd like to look at interactions and both contact interactions, four-point contact interactions, for example, and tree-level exchange. And we'd like to understand what's the analytic structure of those, those interactions in a quasi dissident background. Okay? So can we develop some kind of analytic understanding? Since this is an analytics workshop, the word analytic will make a, a lot of appearance. Um, can we describe these correlation functions in a, in a maximally analytic way? And at a practical level, maybe in the, far, in the far future, this would help us to detect new particles you know, that may exist in the early universe up to very high mass scales, because the inflationary scale might have been very high, and so these particles can be created out of the vacuum just due to the rapid expansion of the, the, the space-time. And so we might get access to particles up to 10 to the 14 GV if inflation happened up to that, that scale. Okay? Um, but that's going to be a kind of a, a secondary by byproduct that's not necessarily the focus of my talk today. Um, okay, so let me tell you precisely the kind of setup that, that we are studying. Um, so we're going to be studying standard slow roll inflation with a single, single field, coupled to extra massive degrees of freedom, but coupled in such a way that the coupling is not so strong that it breaks this the underlying uh, nearly conformal invariance of the, the, the Sitter background. Okay? So what this means in practice is that any cross-couplings between the inflaton and this, these extra degrees of freedom have to have interaction strengths that are larger than... Uh, the scale of time evolution during the Sitter expansion, phi dot, and maybe and smaller than the Planck scale, so anywhere in this, this window. That's a little bit restrictive because, as we will see, this will then not allow very large non-Gaussianities. So if one is interested in things that can be observed you know, in the near future, one is mostly living in regimes where these interaction strengths are larger. Okay? But this window will give us a lot of control and will allow us to use symmetries to kind of classify and characterize these, these correlation functions. Okay? So that's why we are starting there. So what it means is, in such a setup, the inflationary correlators, including correlators mediated by massive particle exchange, um, are determined by the approximate conformal symmetry of the Desita background, evaluated at late times. So taking the isometries of the bulk Desita space-time and mapping them to the future boundary of Desita gives us constraint, symmetry constraints on these cosmological correlators, and we'd like to exploit those symmetry constraints and classify the solutions to those constraint equations. Um, so these symmetries will be restrictive, but not so restrictive that it doesn't allow kind of a freedom of solutions, and therefore we have to look at carefully the, the type of singularities that these solutions will, will have. And some of the singularities will be ruled out on physical grounds, and by, by fixing the singularity structure, we, we uniquely fix the solutions to these, these equations, as we will see. Okay? So just like in the, in the flat space scattering amplitudes language, it's a, it's a combination of symmetries and singularities that you know, severely restricts the allowed structure of the correlation functions. Um, and the upshot is going to be is that we will find kind of specific momentum dependencies that are allowed at late times that encode precisely what's going on in the, you know, in the time-dependent bulk, bulk geometry. 
So that's why we have the slogan, time without time. Time will never make an appearance. It will be replaced by symmetry constraints on the future Euclidean surface uh, after, after inflation. But information of, about time will be encoded in kind of the precise momentum dependence that these correlation functions will have. All right. Um, OK, so the bulk of my talk is going to be slightly technical. So I want to first give you kind of a roadmap of where this calculation is, is going so that when I fill in the details, you kind of can see where we where we're heading at. So the fundamental object of this talk is going to be the following. It's going to be a four-point function in the sitter space with external scalar fields that are conformally coupled. So special values of the masses of these fields, you know, twice the Hubble scale squared. Okay? Um, and then we're looking at correlations that are induced by the exchange or the production of a massive field, massive scalar field. Okay? And that mass here is not restricted. It could be any, any, any mass. Okay? So that looks like a very uh, special object, okay? Um, but wh what's nice is that this simple object, in fact, will relate through kind of a web of differential operations to everything else we care about. So for example, we, we were able to identify simple projection operators that map correlation functions of conformally coupled scalars to massless scalars. And arguably, the massless scalar case is what we're interested in for inflation, because inflation is a nearly massless field. And we can also weakly perturb around massless and get you know, exactly inflation. Um, we also found ladder operators that allow us to raise the, raise the spin of the exchange particle. So although we stu study, in most of this talk, we're going to be studying scalar exchange, acting with simple ladder operators on the solution will give you new solutions that correspond to the exchange of spinning particles. Um, and then finally, if we take one of the legs of this four-point function and evaluate it on the background, so taking one of the momenta to be zero, and simultaneously also perturbing the, the mass of this external field to be slightly, you know, have an epsilon h squared uh, mass contribution, so not exactly massless, but the inflaton case, um, then you actually get inflationary three-point correlation functions. Um, and so one of the highlights, in fact, is going to be is that we're going to be able to reproduce kind of classic results in the inflationary literature in a very quick way. Like Maldacena's famous Leroux result is going to boil down to a very quick calculation of graviton exchange in this kind of this kind of setup. Yeah? Sorry? This thing? Okay, maybe say, yeah, let me, sorry. So this, this is a space-time diagram where time runs up, you know, in space, space horizontal. Sorry? That line is the future boundary. So in, in, in conformal coordinates, the sitter space is described by a conformal coordinate that runs from minus infinity to zero. This you know, black horizontal line is eta equals zero, the final slice of the sitter space. And then there will be reheating and kind of the standard FOW attached to this afterwards. And the recombination was what I had earlier. Okay. So it is, it's really a space, and you can read this time evolving upwards. So the way to read this diagram is that there's a spontaneous production of these massive particles where, you know, out of the vacuum, there are two particles being created. And those two particles then, because they're massive, will decay into lighter fields, for example, the inflaton, and produce higher order correlations in this lighter degree of freedom. So that's the physical process underlying, underlying this. But you can also see, if I make this massive field here very heavy, then this exchange diagram will collapse into a contact interaction. So it, it should also include effective field theory, the effective field theory expansion in the limit where I'm taking the mass to be large. And this particle production, in fact, is an exponentially suppressed effect, a non perturbative correction to this uh, analytic story. Okay, we will see that. Any, any other questions on, on this? Okay, so what I want to do in the rest of the talk is kind of fill in, <laughs> fill in the gaps um, and, uh, and show you a little bit of the, the, this formalism. Okay, okay so we're going to start, start by studying just uh, four-point functions in the sitter space and the simplest type of four-point function, tree-level exchange of a massive scalar with external conformally coupled scalars. But as I've advertised, this will relate to everything else. Okay? So it, it pays kind of to understand this, this correlator in as much detail as possible. Um, so okay, first let me introduce some notation because we're going to have to talk about these things in some way. <laughs> um, so you know, of course, I, so we're going to be looking at a four-point function of scalars here with four different momenta you know, on the final, final slice. And then in a general FRW background, kind of these correlation functions are restricted by homogeneity and isotropy. So they are, um, in particular, this, the, you know, the, the vector momenta have to add up to a quadrilateral. Okay? 
This is what this delta function here is imposing. Um, and then the remaining function f, so my four-point function is going to be a function f, will depend on six scalar variables, um, which I can choose to be the, the, six, uh, the four different side lengths of the quadrilateral. The diagonal length s, that's kind of the three-dimensional analog of uh, the Mandel sum variable s, and then a corresponding uh, t variable that's the three-dimensional analog of the Mandelstam t variable in scattering language, okay? So a priori, just on that, on grounds of homogeneity and isotropy, there are six scalar variables. And we're going to be imposing four constraints from the approximate conformal invariance of these correlators um, on these six variables to reduce it down to basically two, okay? Um, so, in fact, the first symmetry that we're imposing is an approximate scaling invariance due to the, of, of the background. And that will be made manifest by introducing dimensionless variables. So instead of these momenta, I, I will be choosing to use two dimensional, two scalar variables u and v, which are the ratio of this uh, diagonal momentum s and the sum of the side lengths k1 and k2, that's what u is, and then v is going to be the ratio of s to the sum of k3 and k4, okay? And they have been called u and v because kind of in conformal field theory in the uh, um, of course, in, in, in real space, four-point functions depend on only two conformally invariant cross ratios, which are called u and v. But here the story is a bit more complicated because we're going to be working exclusively in Fourier space. But by analogy, we, we are labeling these things u, u and v. Okay? And then you can also rescale the four-point function by some overall momentum scale, which I'm choosing to be s, um, with, a, with a, a power that depends on the scaling dimension of the fields, okay? So this power will be one, for example, if it's conformally coupled scalars on the outside, um, to make a dimensionless uh, four-point function, okay? So that's our basic, basic, uh, basic variables. Um, and choosing this power appropriately will automatically then allow, satisfy scaling symmetry. So the first constraint due to inflationary background <coughs> has been satisfied. And so all of the dynamical information will then be encoded in conformal, approximate conformal invariance of these, these correlators. And so it turns out for um, conformally coupled scalars on the outside, uh, these three constraints can be massaged, massaged into one. Uh, so conformal invariance reduces to one differential equation in terms of a differential operator delta u, it's just a second order differential operator in terms of this u variable acting on this four point function minus the same differential operator with respect to the v variable acting on this four-point function. And physically, what these U, this differential operators are doing is they're telling you how the, how the four-point function is allowed to be deformed when I'm stretching or compressing two of the side lengths while keeping the other two fixed. For the u variable, you would be stretching or compressing k1 and k2, while for the v variable, you would be stretching and compressing k3 and k, k4. Okay. Um, so that's how, that's, you know, how time is, will be encoded in kind of the momentum dependence of this. It's like an evolution equation, but evolving now into, in, in momenta on the, on the boundary. Um, so what we then did is we classified solutions to this equation, starting first with contact interactions, then moving to exchange diagrams, and then finally inflationary 3.0. Oh, yeah. It will, it will show up here. It will show up here because uh, perturbatively I can change the De Sitter answer that I'm obtaining here and make it inflation by evaluating one of the legs on the background and making the mass of that background field to be slightly non-zero in exactly the right way to, to, to mimic the mass dependence of the inflaton. Okay? So inflaton usually has a mass that's of order epsilon h squared with a precise coefficient. So that means that the scaling dimension of this field will not be exactly three. It would be, it would be three if it's massless, but we will use three plus epsilon, expand an epsilon, and we will get a correlation function that applies to inflation. And manifestly so, in fact, I will show you, I will show you consistency checks where inflationary answers that people have obtained by kind of slightly laborious bulk calculations will be reproduced by, by, by this. Okay. Um, okay, so let's start with contact interactions. So it turns out that contact interactions correspond to the simplest possible analytics, analytic structures that, that is allowed by, by these equations. So for example, a bulk phi to the four interaction in this language corresponds to a solution to these equations that has a simple pole in the combination u plus, u plus v. And if you go back to my definitions, this u plus v corresponds to the sum of the energies of all of the modes, or the sum of the magnitudes of the momenta, equal to zero. So it turns out a contact interaction has a pole in that unphysical region, 
And the simplest contact interaction just has a simple pole. And then all higher order interactions, all higher derivative bulk interactions, are reproduced by acting with this differential operator delta u multiple times. Okay? So it generates the derivative expansion in the bulk, but purely from the point of view of the boundary. Um, and that just corresponds to higher order poles in this variable uh, u plus v, or, or k total. Okay? So it's very simple. They're, they're non-analytic, but at, at the, um, in, the, in the simplest possible, possible way. Um, and you can just check that these are solutions to the equation explicitly. Okay? Um, then it turns out that these solutions will act as sources for the exchange diagrams. So if we want to study exchange diagram, we actually split this differential constraint equation into two, two equations. These are now ODEs rather than PDEs, where the first equation is just the differential operator delta u plus an integration constant, which will turn out to play the role of mass, acting on the four-point function, just giving you the corresponding contact. Yeah? And then similarly, there's a second equation uh, with, with u, u and v interchanged. Okay? Um, and so that's just a just to give you a rough sense where this equation comes from, this is the analog of taking an amplitude and multiplying it through with an inverse propagator. So minus s plus m squared, if you multiply an amplitude with that and it has a single, simple, simple pole, the remaining function will be analytic and correspond to some contact, contact uh, contribution. Okay? And you can also see it for here, if I take the mass going to infinity limit, this differential operator here will become irrelevant, and this four-point function just reduces to the source with some rescaling, and just becomes a pure contact contribution, as it should when we send the mass to, mass to be very large. Okay? Um, okay? So these are now two coupled equations that we're trying to solve instead of two coupled ODEs rather than one single uh, PDE. Okay, um, okay so, um, so it's relatively straightforward to kind of analyze the, both the, the homogeneous and particular solutions to this equation given some contact solution like the, the ones on top as an input, okay? Um, however, in general, in the most general case, these solutions will have singularities. So for example, it's relatively easy to check, well, it's straightforward to see just from the structure of this differential operator delta u, that there, in general, will be a singular logarithmic singularity in the limit where this u variable goes to plus one. And going back to the familiar k, k vectors, this corresponds to the sum of k1 and k2 equaling the diagonal s, so the, this flattened configuration of the, the four-point function. And from bulk reasoning, this is precisely the limit where we don't expect to have singular behavior if we start from a bunch Davis vacuum state. Okay? It's, it's a signature of you know, excited states in the, in the vacuum. And if we want to describe correlators that you know, resulted from you know, standard initial conditions without any excitations, um, we'd like to, this, this singularity not to be there. Okay? And it's possible to remove the singularity simply by adding a homogeneous, appropriate homogeneous solution to the, to the, to the answer. Okay? Um, and then actually there's a, second, there's a second singularity that we do like, which is when you, uh, let's see, how does it go? Um, da, da, da. Yeah, let me, there's a second singularity when you go to the unphysical region, which is when you send u to minus v, I think. Yeah. In that regime, actually, the answer factorizes into a product of three particle amplitudes. That's something we expect. It's a kind of a flat space limit of this correlator as well. Um, and we're normalizing the coefficient of that limit appropriately. Okay? So there are two kind of boundary conditions to these correlators that are, that are found by thinking about which singularities we would like to keep and which singularities we would like to reject. And we're going to be rejecting this one, and we're going to be keeping the other one. Um, and so that then completely fixes the, the, the solution, okay? Um, so let me show you uh, what the solution looks like. Um, so actually that is a simplified version of the solution that's easier to write down. Um, so if we take the limit of small u, just for simplicity of putting things on a, on a slide. Yeah? Um, in that limit, kind of the solution takes the following form. There's a series, analytic series expansion that describes the inhomogeneous solution to this equation for given, given contact interaction, which I've chosen to be the simplest one. Um, and then there's a non-perturbative correction here, where this mu parameter basically plays a role of the mass of the field in Hubble units. Okay. Um, so just to highlight, there are two pieces to this answer. The first piece is uh, the analog of the standard EFT expansion of the correlator. It's, it's perfectly analytic to all orders in this, this, this expansion. Um, and it describes precisely the h squared over m squared effects that you get from integrating out a massive particle during, during inflation. 
But then there's a second piece that has to exist in order to satisfy kind of the singularity structure that we were imposing. And that second piece uh, corresponds to particle production in this, in this background. It's, it's non-analytic in momenta, okay? And has an amplitude that scales as exponentially suppressed as e to the minus m over h, actually with a factor of pi if you're, if you're accurate, okay? Okay, so just like in the particle physics case, we found two pieces. There's a low energy EFT piece, and then there's a non-perturbative correction corresponding to particle production in this expanding, expanding background. It turns out that the particle production piece actually do dominates if you go to a special limit of this correlator. So imagine you take the diagonal of this four-point function and you collapse it to zero. Or later in a three-point function case, this would correspond to one of the side length of the triangle collapsing to zero. So these collapsed or squeezed limits of the correlators. Uh, in that limit, because the EFT piece was analytic, it actually vanishes precisely, and you become dominated by this non-perturbative correction. And this non-perturbative correction has a, you know, it's oscillating. Notice the sign dependence here. It's oscillating with an argument that depends on the mass of the new particle, okay? So measuring these oscillations, or seeing these oscillations is the analog of seeing the, the position of a resonance in a, in a collider experiment, okay? Um, um, but now we actually have a little bit more than that because in addition to that, we have a correlated effective field theory piece. So we have the full shape of this correlator that has oscillations um, at squeezed momenta, um, and then those oscillations transitions into a smooth piece that correspond to the, the effective field theory, the correlated effective field theory contribution from, from this massive, massive field. And that's the analog like in, 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 a, in, a, you know, in, a, in a scattering amplitude case, we have an EFT contribution of a rising cross section and then we have an, a resonance peak, and often one learns a lot about uh, these things have to be consistent if the interpretation of a single massive field you know, wants to be supported. And so it's nice to have kind of a complete description of both particle production and EFT um, valid throughout the entire momentum space of these correlation functions. Okay, are there any questions about this? So in the paper, you'll also see the full solution. It also has the same structure. There are two pieces. There's a slightly more complicated series solution for the inhomogeneous <coughs> piece. And then the, the homogeneous solution has a, is just a, pr a product of hypergeometric functions rather than this simple sign. Okay, but it's completely explicit uh, in, in, the, in that form. All right. So maybe, let me see. Uh, yeah. Let me say, just say a few words because it's kind of intriguing, but uh, incomplete. Uh, about what we can do having this analytic solution available, you can ask kind of questions about the function in the complex plane. Yeah? So you can analytically continue these correlators in the complex plane and you, you discover a structure that looks something like this in the complex U plane, for example, um, where it's analytic everywhere except for a branch point at the origin. This is the, these logarithmic oscillations that we were, we were seeing. And then also a branch point at, at, at minus one uh, connected by a, a branch cut. <laughs> And in fact, there's a, there's a particularly simple, uh, interesting point, which is when the u variable goes to minus, minus v. Uh, let me remind you what this means. u going to minus v in the original variables means the sum of the energy is going to zero. That's the same kind of limit that we were saw, sawing singular behaviors for the, for the contact uh, s solution. It turns out if you, if you look at what this, what this solution looks like in that limit, um, so it has a logarithmic singularity, that's what the branch cut that we were, were seeing with an amplitude that's precisely the flat space scattering amplitude in the high energy limit. So to, in some sense, the cosmological correlator encodes, includes kind of flat space scattering in this very particular limit of taking the sums of the energies going to zero. Okay? Of course, that's an unphysical limit. You have to reach that limit by analytic <coughs> continuation because some of the energies have to be negative. But nevertheless, the, the structure of the entire correlator kind of knows about flat space scattering um, in, in, in this way. Right? Um, this is something, of course, that has been anticipated from the bulk. So when you write down explicit bulk integrals, you will always feel, see some oscillating wave a contribution like this. Um, mm -hmm. This integral will then get most of its contributions from early times, sending conformal time to minus infinity. If you go to very early times, that means the boundary is very far away, and you expect to reproduce you know, flat space. Uh, at those times, kind of the theory doesn't know that there's a boundary to come, <laughs> and you kind of reproduce flat space uh, results, and that's precisely what one is, is, is seeing. And it's also short wavelength or high energy results, so you expect to see the flat space scattering amplitude in the high energy limit, right? But because it's the high energy limit, it's also particularly interesting because it's sensitive to the UV completion of the theory. So what type of singular structure we see actually does depend on how you complete the theory. 
So if you, if you are a low energy observer, imagine, uh, no, we are, so we don't have to imagine. <laughs> Uh, as a low energy observer, we will measure as, as, at, at leading order, say we measure a phi to the fourth interaction. This phi to the fourth interaction will have a one over k total pole, as we saw. Yeah? But then going to high energies, we actually see that this phi to the fourth interaction descended from integrating out a massive field in, of this type of coupling, phi squared, phi squared sigma. And that has a softer singularity, k total log k total. Okay? But nevertheless, singular. And if you were to draw a contour integral you know, at large radius around k total equals zero, you would get the same answer depending, independent of which type of EFT approximation you're making to this. So lo a local quantum field theory completion of, of this theory will have the same kind of single, you know, not quite the same singularity, but like the overall singular structure is, is still there. Um, what's interesting, however, is that you know, you know, everything we, we think we know about quantum gravity completions of theories is that they have an intrinsic uh, non-locality built into them. Uh, that should soften high energy scattering and soften it exactly in such a way that this singularity should not be there. Okay? Um, so in some sense, this is how stringy UV completion is encoded in, in, the, in the structure of this correlation function. You, you know, in the fully complete theory, you would not expect to see this, this singularity. Um, unfortunately, this singularity, of course, is in unphysical regime, so I'm not sure how this will be observed, but maybe uh, thinking about contour arguments you know, allows you actually to relate this to something, something physical. Okay. Anyway, this is just a kind of a side comment, a digression um, about kind of an intriguing structure that these correlators have, and you can check explicitly. Every solution that we have, you can take that limit and you can identify the type of singularity that you get there and the fact that this, the strength of the singularity is related to the strength of scattering in the flat space limit. Okay? Okay, so as I said at the beginning, um, this looked like a very special object, a four-point function of, with scalar exchange and conformally coupled scalars on the outside. Um, but I will now show you, you know, kind of a, a web of interesting relations that relates this to everything else you could possibly want to know about this specific kind of setup. So the first thing you might want to know is how does the structure change when the exchange particle is not a massive scalar, but a massive scalar with some spin. Okay? So uh, uh, it becomes a little bit more complicated, but not too much. Um, so this is now a new four-point function labeled by S, the spin of the exchange particle. <coughs> We can write it as a, as a sum over the different helicity contributions, which I've labeled M. Each helicity contribution will con correspond to a specific angular dependence, so the polarization sum sums that arise for each helicity, with coefficient functions that uh, determine the strength of each of the helicity contributions. And it turns out that these coefficient functions satisfy a differential equation that's very similar to what we saw before, uh, with differential operators delta U, but now labeled with an index M and delta V, with the same index m. So these are very similar looking differential operators with a slight shift in certain uh, a number of the coefficients of this, these operators. Okay? Um, what's also interesting then is that we can write the top helicity component purely in terms of the scalar solution that we found previously by acting s times with a specific ladder operator. So we start with the solution that we just found, you act on it s times with a ladder operator, you generate the top helicity component of the uh, spinning exchange. And in fact, all other helicity components can be also be written in, in terms of this, this scalar solution. So there was one fundamental object that we have already studied in some detail. You act on, in, on this solution you know, in different ways um, to generate you know, a spinning, spinning exchange. And so this is explicitly what this looks like, for example, for spin one and, and spin two. It's not, so there, there's, there are known differential operations that you have to, uh, have to use in order to, to convert uh, spin zero four-point function to a spin two or spin one or spin s uh, solution. Okay, so I think that's very nice that there was just one fundamental object we had to solve, and everything else follows. Um, okay, and this is something I, I alluded to earlier that if we if you now go back to the special limit that we discussed earlier, where you collapse the diagonal of this four-point function, um, uh, this 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 approach to the collapsed limit can depend on angle. And um, if, you, if you, for example, approach this and then, you know, imagine you fix the, the long or sh short momentum um, as a ratio to the, to the high momentum, and then rotate this angle, you would expect a specific angular dependence that depends on the spin of the particle, just like in the scattering amplitudes uh, case. And this is precisely what, what you see from these, these solutions when you, when you look at them. Okay? 
So that's the analog of, of the final state angular dependence that we, we discussed in the case of collider physics. Okay, so then in my remaining five minutes, uh, I'm going to discuss how all of this relates to inflationary three-point correlation functions, and I'm going to show you the result from 1 a.m. <laughs> last, last night, okay? Um, okay, so so far we have studied a specific case where the external fields had special values of their masses, which was twice the Hubble scale squared, which corresponds to a scaling dimension of these, these fields, which is, is two. Okay, that, that's nice because the structure of the solutions are simple, you know, rational functions, and that's, it's as close as you can get from the sitter space to flat space almost. Um, but what we really care about for inflation is nearly massless fields. Yeah? So the mass approximately zero and scaling dimension three plus epsilon. And then we're going to be working perturbatively in this low roll parameter epsilon. Um, so the first step is to kind of try and relate the solutions that we just obtained to solutions for massless external fields, and that's, that's done by so-called weight shifting operators that we have, have, have found. Um, and schematically, they kind of look like this. These are just differential operations in terms of the ori original momenta acting on the four-point functions that we found for the conformally coupled scalars. And so that gives you a simple algorithm that takes as an input these four-point functions that we discussed and gives us an output the new four-point functions that we'd like to, um, like to have. Okay. Um, um, and then if we want to study inflationary three-point functions, as I said before, we want to take one of the legs and evaluate it on the background. That means we take one of the momenta, say the momentum K4, to go to zero, and we slightly perturb the mass of the field that lives on that external leg, and then we symmetrize all the legs. That's the, that's the procedure. And what this gives us is it gives us a bispectrum of inflationary fluctuations now, yeah? That's, uh, that can be determined in the following way. It's this weight changing operator acting on these two legs, uh, these two legs uh, one and two, okay? Um, it's, there's an epsilon dependence because we work at first order in epsilon. And then everything is determined by one function of just the variable u, which was the, the normalized ratio of these momenta on the first two legs. And then we have to symmetrize over all the, all the legs, okay? Um, and this, this function b of u, is simply the, the limit of the four-point function for the conformally coupled fields that we had when we send v equals to one. v equals to one corresponds, in this case, to k go, k4 going to zero. Yeah? That's why it's this particular limit of this, this four-point function. But that's the algorithm. We start off with the solution that we had. We take the v going to one limit and feed it into here, act on it with a weight-changing operator, and that should give us the inflationary uh, three-point correlation function. And you can show that for spin exchange, only the longitudinal mode of the field contributes. So actually, we had all of these different helicity contributions in the case of spinning fields, but actually only the lowest helicity will contribute to the final answer once you take this particular limit. So that's kind of nice. So, so spinning, spinning exchange is not that much more complicated than scalar exchange as far as the three-point function is concerned. Okay, so let me just show you a, a few examples um, as, as consistency checks. So for example, imagine you take the simplest contact one of the simplest contact interactions in the bulk. So this shift symmetric partial phi to the fourth. This is something that was calculated you know, in the conventional way by, by Criminelli, just as an integral over the bulk interactions. Um, and the answer looks something like this. Okay? So what I claim is that this answer reduces to just that simple function in this language that we, we developed. Okay? So if you take u over u plus one, <laughs> feed it into this machinery that I showed on the previous slide, and symmetrize over the momentum, you get precisely, precisely this, okay? Um, so there's somehow some kind of a nice simple object that was derived from the you know, conformally invariant four-point function with conformally coupled scalars uh, that leads to this function here, but then feeding this function into this, into this kind of differential operations gives you the more complicated looking answer that we, that we know, okay? Um, the second thing that we were able to produce last night, uh, in fact, is if you take this exchange and you make the internal field a massless spin two particle, so the graviton, yeah, um, then there was an expectation that this should correspond precisely to, to Maldacena's famous result for the three-point function in standard slow roll inflation. And so this is what we found yesterday. Uh, I didn't dare to put the function b of u because I want to check, uh, but it's some very simple looking thing just like this, array, very simple, yeah. Um, that when you feed it into this operation, it will give you precisely the sort of uh, three-point function that Malasena derived, okay? 
And on physical grounds, that ex that's expected because that, that result is really physically, in four-point function language, is the exchange of a graviton. Um, and the longitudinal mode of the graviton, in fact, becomes a, a Newtonian potential, so it's not really a, a propagating, it's a, non, it's a non-dynamical field. So you get kind of a local interaction back, so it looks very much like a contact interaction. And then going to the three-point function, in fact, we see exactly all of that playing, playing out. Okay? Um, and then, then, of course, you can do more. You can kind of take all of the solutions that we generated for massive particles of arbitrary mass and spin and generate three-point functions from this. And you will see a lot of the things that have been discussed in special limits kind of validated in, in that way. Um, but I think the nice thing about our solutions is that they are valid you know, for, for, you know, not just for squeeze limits, but for arbitrary momentum configurations. Okay, so in my last uh, minus one, one minute, let me just summarize. Um, so what I've derived is in this specific context, and I can't emphasize this enough, of weakly broken conformal symmetry, we have derived the most general three and four point functions arising from massive particle exchange during inflation. I've showed you how uh, there's a fundamental object that relates to a lot of uh, different cases by acting with, special, with operators on this fundamental object. Uh, and we have discussed a little bit the analytic structure of that fundamental object and how it relates to flat space scattering. Um, I should also highlight before I leave that uh, these signals will be very hard to observe in practice, mostly because we are restricting ourselves to this lamppost of weakly broken conformal, and that restricts how strongly interacting <coughs> the inflaton can be with uh, these massive fields. Um, but there are ways of kind of taking the same idea and kind of making the signal much, much larger by, by going away from that, that specific limit. Um, and uh, kind of Eva and others have worked on, on those kind of uh, enhanced uh, non-Gaussian uh, signal. Um, and having said that, even if the signals are, are, are small, I think it's, 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 it's important to look for them because they are the most direct way we have of probing the ultraviolet completion of the theory. Um, so these massive fields are things that we expect in a completion of, of inflation, and it would be fantastic if we were able to see kind of imprints of, of, of these fields in a direct sense, rather than you know, having to argue about the absence of, of, of ultraviolet effects. Um, and then finally, my main focus on this was really to try and uh, develop a, uh, so less practical but more conceptual, try to develop an improved analytic understanding of these correlation functions that might help us to answer kind of some fundamental questions about these correlation functions. So I've discussed kind of how time is encoded in these correlation functions, time and causality. Um, it would be very fascinating if we could understand how unitarity, unitary bulk evolution is encoded on the, on the boundary. Yeah? Because it's well known that in scattering amplitudes, if you know, you know, the combinations of causality and time dependence and uh, unitarity allow you to put strong constraints on possible effective field theories. So the hope would be that if we were able to use this framework to understand unitary evolution um, and unitarity from the point of view of the boundary, that this would help us to also put constraints on what possible low energy effective theories are consistent with a you know, weakly coupled uh, UV completion. But, uh, this is something we're looking at right now. So thank you very much.